Okay, no worries. Cheers, mate. Okay, folks, uh, good morning and thanks for having us along. My name's Chris. I work for a company called Cardale. And uh, what we, excuse me, I said, turn my fan off. Uh, what we sort of specialise in is uh, helping companies develop communication plans, uh, communication strategies, and look at different ways uh, for employee engagement. Now, today I, I've been asked to come along. I know you, you folks are having your sort of safety week this week, um, and I don't want to just talk about health and safety. Uh, what I want to really look at is, is some of the psychological subtleties that go on between different people and the impact that can have on the relationships that we've got, got with each other and in return the performance outputs that we can see because of that. Um, now there's a few topics I want to cover with you uh, over the sort of short space of time that we've got uh, and I also want to be able to give you some practical tools and sort of takeaways that you can have and maybe experiment with to see if you can uh, find any differences happening for you out there in the workplace for KN. So first off, uh, one of the, the first topics I want to cover is, is to look beyond um, just human behaviour. Now, for a long time now, industry and organisations have been absolutely fascinated with human behaviour and all behaviour really is, really breaking it down simplistically, is the things that we say and do. Now, sometimes behaviour uh, can be planned. You, you, people strategize and think through what they're doing. Sometimes there's unplanned things that go on and that's the stuff that fascinates us at Cardale. Um, so when we talk about behaviour, uh, behaviour, um, there's a driver generally for it. Now, what we, we, we believe is it all really starts on the inside with your inner representations and your beliefs about things. So behaviour is, is not just completely sporadic, it is driven. Now, when you look at uh, beliefs, beliefs are something that we all hold in life. Um, and what we, we say, how, how they lead to your behaviour is your beliefs will have a major impact on your expectations in life. What you expect will impact your emotional state, how you feel, and how you feel will then dictate what happens on the outside for you. Now, there's lots and lots of examples of how this works for us in day-to-day -day life. Uh, let's just look at something uh, very quick and simple. Let some people wake up every day and they have a belief that their glass is half full. So they expect great things to happen for them because they're expecting great things emotionally in the inside. They feel pretty confident, enthusiastic and positive. So on the outside, they demonstrate that in their behaviour. They'll smile lots, they'll say good morning to people and they'll do what they can to have a nice day. Uh, but other people wake up in the same world in the same day and they have a belief that their glass is half empty. So they then will probably lead them to have expectations of bad things, um, things not working out for them that day, which will probably lead them to feel a bit demotivated on the inside, you know, a low emotional state, which again, will feed out through their behaviour. You could smile at one of these people, say good morning to them, ask them how they're doing, and they'll tend to just grunt at you. And that tends to only be on a good day. Now, this is, it's more than just as, as simple as that. There's lots of examples examples of, of where this can have an impact for us. Um, like for example, I don't know if anyone that's that's tuned into this just now has ever maybe been uh, heading home one night and you've got a belief, you just don't know why, that when you get home, your partner is going to be in a horrible, stinking mood, uh, which will probably lead you to have an expectation of an argument breaking out when you get home. And because you've got that expectation, that's probably going to lead you to start planning how the argument's going to fall, follow, what path it will lead, uh, which will affect your emotional state. You know, you'll probably start feeling a bit more anxious and frustrated about going home. So when you do get home, your behaviour is slightly different from normal, meaning instead of being warm and cuddly, like I'm sure you all normally would be, uh, you'll probably be found to be a bit more sheepish and standoffish, you know, probably standing in the corner with the eyebrows down, the, the arms folded, your partner will change, uh, notice that change in your usual behavioural response. They'll ask you the age-old question, 
what's wrong with you? And you'll tend to answer that with the two word answer that starts every argument in the planet. You'll probably turn to them and say, nothing, why? And as soon as you ask that, that's when the fighting tends to start. And as soon as the fighting begins, you're saying to yourself inside, I knew that was going to happen. And it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you really want to, as a leader, have a good understanding of behaviour, um, it's really, for me, about starting to identify what people believe about themselves and situations that they find themselves in, because that's the thing that can push them forward or hold them back. Now, considering that we are talking about health and safety here, um, <clears throat> it is good to look at what you feel the possible current beliefs are within uh, the people that you're responsible with uh, for uh, what their current belief sort of mindset is when it comes to things like health and safety. And if we're truly wanting to go on this sort of well-being journey within KN, where it's more than just the physical stuff that we're looking out for, uh, we might need to look start, beyond, start looking beyond just what people are physically doing for us when they're out there on the site. Now, one of the things that can have an impact on the beliefs of others is what we see, hear, and feel from those around us. So this is why I'm saying it's really good for you as a leader, maybe you can start considering what the beliefs are, because once you can figure out what the beliefs are, you might need to think about what can I inject in? What can I demonstrate to my people around me so that they can maybe start forming new beliefs about this stuff? Because if they believe it's only about the business, it's about statistics, and it's about getting shouted at when things go wrong, why would they ever actively engage with it in a proper, full, proper, meaningful way for themselves? Because at the end of the day, you as a leader, you do have your belief, your expectations, your emotions, and your behaviours. But think about that old saying for a minute. It's always, I'll believe it when I see it. It's not, I'll believe it when somebody tells me in a brief one day. So people are constantly, continually looking around themselves, looking for clues as to what they should believe about those that are around them. Now, your be behaviour feeds directly into somebody else's beliefs, because what you, you say and do will have an impact on what they believe about you as a leader. So I'll, I like to personally look at that sort of link between your behaviour, your actions, and somebody else's belief and mindset, almost like a bridge, you know? and. Bridges, you get all different types of bridges in the world, don't you? Um, you get very well engineered bridges out there that are very strong. They can take a lot of pressure, stress and weight. And no matter what, you'll probably have confidence every time you cross that. But I'm sure you've all seen bridges as well that maybe have not been as engineered as well. They're uh, maybe a bit shaky, maybe not too strong looking in their strength and you'd probably be a bit more hesitant to cross that bridge. Now, for us as leaders, the strength of our relationship bridges is essential for us to get a handle on if we're going to truly help our people ensure they're getting home safe at the end of every day, because relationship bridges are really the foundation for engagement and trust. Now, think back to, for a moment, because we've all got these relationship bridges in our life. Let's look at a, a situation away from the workplace for a moment, because you've been learning about this stuff since being kids. It's just the learning tends not to be conscious. You don't realise it's, it's this is all subtly learned in the background. So let's look at being a kid for a second. And there would have been certain people um, in your life, maybe teachers, think about teachers for a second at school, there would have been certain teachers that you had at school that you knew you could trust no matter what. If you were stuck, you had an issue, no matter how challenging it was, you wanted to ask a question, you had such a strong trust and relationship with that person. That bridge was that strong that you felt confident enough to stick your hand up and cross that bridge and ask them for some help and support, okay? But there would have been other teachers that you may have had that you maybe never had that same strong bridge with. That trust wasn't there because maybe you didn't feel uh, there was strength there in that bridge. And maybe you felt as if you were to try and cross that, to stick your hand up to ask a question. You may stumble, you may fall, and you may, might take a big fall 
and that isn't a nice place for anyone to find themselves in, especially if they're feeling that they're wanting to talk about things that are challenging or frustrating. People need to feel as if there's a level of trust there. So as leaders, it's about time now for us maybe to look beyond just what's physically happening outside on the ground. Maybe we should be starting to inspect the strength of our bridges because that's that's where um, our responsibility really lies as leaders. If we truly want to lead people, it's more than just telling them what to do. They need to feel as if they've got that bridge there between them and us that they can cross and they'll be supported no matter what they're up against. Now, if we are really going to try and develop that sense out there, within the people, within the, the workforce, we might need to look at some things that will help form new beliefs and reinforce some of the strengths in some of our bridges. Now, one of the things that help form beliefs for other people is a thing that we call mental pairing. Now, mental pairing isn't anything really um, all that new. This has been about for us for a very, very long time. In fact, it's the model that advertisers use to sell us products on the TV on a daily basis. Now, advertisers know if they're going to sell you something, they need to make you feel as positive as you, they can about their product if they've got half a chance of you purchasing it. Now, because I mean, what I mean by that really is think about it. Uh, imagine walking down the aisle in the supermarket and you see a box in the shelf. I don't know many people that would look at the box and go, oh, that stuff looks really depressing. I'm going to buy myself some of that. OK, it's just, just not how advertising and uh, shopping for goods works for us. So they need to bombard you with good feelings. And if you check out any advert that's trying to sell you something on the TV later on, they'll at least loosely try to follow this model where they'll go, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, good feeling, give you a picture of the product name, um, give you a big clear picture of the product, then they'll repeat that advert over and over and over and over again to you over a period of about a month or so. And the theory is after a period of repetition with the emotional state and that product, boom, the brain pairs the two things together. So you see that product in the supermarket, you unconsciously get a nice feeling about it and you don't feel guilty about buying it. Now, I know it might sound very simplistic, uh, but some advertisers are brilliant at playing this game. Um, like uh, Iron Brew adverts, uh, if you've seen any of them, they are amazing at linking their product to good feelings. It's all full of humour and it's, it has great successes for them. Um, some advertisers do take it a bit too far, like the links effect, uh, like that's not quite quite fully in reality, you know, but there is these games that's played out there to try and pair uh, products up with emotions so that people are more likely to buy it. But when we look at the health and safety world, we've maybe actually been playing the mental pairing game for a long time ourselves. We have been fully aware of it, but we might not have looked at it the same way as an advertiser has. Because a lot of businesses that, that guys like myself visit, when we sit in, in things like safety meetings and briefs, um, quite often the topics of health, safety and the likes are, tend to be linked with lots of negativity. OK, so like I can sit in a meeting and somebody will be up the front giving the safety brief and it will just be statistics of here's all the bad things that's happened over the past week. Here it is over the past month. Here's all the bad stuff over the previous year. Um, some places like to project into the future as well and say, here's all the bad stuff we're allowed to do next year. You know, that's almost like for, for me as somebody that's, my background isn't health and safety, it's it's therapy. So for me, that's like seen as goal setting in, in the world that I come from. Here's where we're aiming for the future, which is counterproductive in my view. We also like to follow that up with lots of graphics, uh, pictures of death, destruction, people with, with bits of their body missing, uh, videos of accidents happening. Um, and sometimes we'll even bring living witnesses in to tell you about horrific events that have happened to them and the impact it's had in their life. But if we're conti we continue down this route, only talking about the bad things and talking about the fear and the anxieties that if we don't get this right, eventually that is 
the emotional state that gets linked up with health and safety. But the other thing to consider is if it's yourself as the leader that's been seen to lead that off, your face will also get paired up with a, 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 a negative emotional state as well. And that's when we can get in these situations where people like us can walk into rooms, because I'm sure you'll all have people like this in your own lives, where there'll be certain people that you can see walk towards you, instantly you get good feelings, because you know you're going to be able to stop and have a chat and a laugh and a joke with those people, but there'll be other people in your life, as soon as they walk towards you, you get bad feelings because you know it's just going to be doom, gloom and misery. So people are constantly doing this. And if we truly want to have good, strong relationship bridges between us and the frontline people that are knocking at home for us every day, we need to consider some of these mental pairs. Because think about even in your personal life, for those people that fill you full of that sense of, of bad feelings and negativity because of previous experience, you know, you're less cooperative with these people because there is this little law out there in psychology. Um, it's known as the law of liking. And all the law of liking really states is the more people in life that like they, they, they like you, the more they're influenced by you and the more they'll want to help you achieve goals. But if people don't like you, they're more likely to pull hurdles out in front of you, trip you up and probably try to uh, make you fail when things aren't quite going right for you. And that's a dangerous position for anyone in leadership to truly find themselves in, because then you may not just be a leader, you may actually be seen as a manager, somebody that goes through the motions, ticks the boxes and gets things that need done done. And that is it. So leadership has got this whole emotional sort of connection to it that sometimes can be easily overlooked as we're throwing about the term leader lots in industry without fully understanding it. So these are key things that I would I would think it would be amazing if people in positions like yourselves could maybe consider just reflecting on as you sort of move forward. Now another angle, another angle on this um, that I want to share with you is it links back to to the mental pairing. Uh, it links back to the bridges and the belief and the mindset stuff that we've been talking about as well is the role of a topic called reciprocity. Now, this is a key thing for anyone in an influencer's position to understand. Now, reciprocity is really just a, a very posh word that uh, psychologists use for effectively act revenge. You know, but, it does, but when you use words like payback and revenge, it, come, pick, it paints pictures of negative things. But reciprocity can also be used for positive things as well. Now, let me give you some examples of, of, of how it works, because all it essentially is, is if um, we, as human beings, we get this urge that if somebody does something or gives something to us, positively or negatively, quite often we like to pay that back positively or negatively. And the reason for that is, is, is human beings are have been fascinated forever with, with a thing called justice, okay? And we like to feel as if there's a sense of justice in the world um, for rights and wrongs. You know, that justice could be uh, the reason why, for example, we've got criminal courts out there, but it's also that sense of justice is why we like to publicly recognise people for going above and beyond because it feels justified. So justice is a great tool to understand, especially when you link it to this reciprocity topic. Now, like I say, let me show you how it works. Would be situations like this, um, like coming up to, to Christmas time soon, you may find yourself uh, in a shopping centre, doing Christmas shopping with your, your partner or whatever. And it's a common, common conversation to hear couples have at this time of the year, things like, I wish so-and-so would stop buying our kids Christmas presents because that means we don't need to buy for them. That's just a, a very simple example of uh, this sense of we need to pay that back. 
um, that we, we we have. We don't know why it happens. It's just a, a, an overwhelming urge that we quite often have. Um, but it also works, like I say, negatively as well. Um, if you if you can imagine, uh, well, I like to imagine it. Like we've all got these imaginary scales that sit in the top of our head. Uh, we call them like the scales of justice. So if you can imagine you control one side, the rest of the world controls the other side of your scale. Now, say you find yourself in a situation where your scales are unbalanced by somebody else, like maybe, maybe you're at work, maybe somebody more senior comes up and screams at you for something that you had nothing to do with, Vom instantly that will unbalance your scale. So what you tend to do is you play about with your side to see what you can do to bring justice back into your world. So you may, after that screaming match, start having conversation with, with yourself um, along the lines of, how dare they speak to me like that? That had nothing to do with me. Uh, that was completely unjustified. That was unfair. Right, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work slower for a month. That will show them. Ah, and justice is restored back to your world. So this is something that we're doing continually. And if you want to get a good, great, great uh, handle on it, watch your kids come uh, growing up, watch them fighting and disagreeing with each other. You see it everywhere. But the thing is, when you look at this in adults, adults become a bit more complicated when they're dealing with it. Because for some people, justice isn't about getting that, getting that reciprocity, the payback instant. Some people like to do that whole uh, revenge is a dish best served cold. And some people will wait and wait and wait and wait for the right moment. It can be months down the line before they hit you with a bit of payback. So as influencers and leaders out there, if you really want to have these good, strong relationship bridges, between you and those that you're responsible for, I would definitely say reciprocity is something that you want to have a look at. Um, look out for all these little payback events that can be going on. Uh, some businesses I visit, you can actually see it between departments. You know, a lot of companies have got people um, almost like departments competing now. That's how it feels at times. So sometimes I've seen departments actually try to mess with things for each other just to throw a spanner in the works. For each, and you get all these reciprocity payback justice games playing out in our local area. And it's, it can be pretty, pretty fascinating for somebody like myself, an outsider looking in, seeing that sort of stuff. So watch out for it because it is out there. Now, another topic, very quickly, uh, before I give you some practical tools that I think it would be very interesting for people like yourselves to, to, to consider um, and also to be aware of at the minute is, is the role that despondency can sometimes play when it comes to behavioural outputs, performance and the strength of the bridges between you and other people around you. Um, now, in, in today's world, we're obviously living in very bizarre times uh, with lots of changes going on, lots of new rules and new ways of working and living happening for all of us. Um, and the changes are happening continually. Now, what can happen quite regularly for people is if there's a sense in their life that there's uncertainty going on for a lot of things. Uh, anxiety tends to build. And anxiety can sometimes as well, if it's left to, to, to sort of bed in for a period of time, can also lead people to starting to feel slightly despondent towards the situations that they find themselves in. Now, despondency um, is basically the sense of the head dropping, you know, the disengagement, the, 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 the lack of uh, connection the way that somebody normally would be. Now, we're finding this lots just now across the nation and many, many different businesses that we are um, engaged with. And this seems to be something that's, that's that's really starting to rise its head regularly. Now, for, for people like us as influencers, this is something we need to look out for uh, in our people. Because it's a bit like when despondency sets in in a group setting, uh, it can be a bit like a sports team. You know, I mean, a sports team, I'm sure you've all seen it when there's a team out there that they've, do they've done well for a while and then something's going on 
um, inside the, that team and heads drop, even though that team still want to go out and still want to win and knock it home every single game, their heads just aren't quite in the right place for performance to make that happen. Now, even though they want to win, that emotional low is the thing that's impacting them. Not the, not the physical abilities, it's the emotional low. Now, that can happen in industry just now as well, you know, with, like I say, lots of changes, new ways of living, new ways of working, but also people are going to have personal issues going on at home that they've maybe not fully opened up with, uh, with anyone around them yet. And they may be carrying this into the workplace. And long gone are the days where we should be as leaders saying, look, when you've got problems, you leave them at the gate here. You don't bring them into the workplace. Because as human beings, none of us have the ability to do that. You know, it's impossible, um, it's emotionally impossible to do that. Because when you've got stuff going on, you're going to, you're going to focus in on that, you're going to daydream, and um, you're going to be distracted by that at points throughout your day continually. Um, so it's been aware of the impact this can have. And if it starts to, despondency starts to set in and as, and a, as a team, that's when people start looking out for each other as much because they're focused in on their own anxieties and stressors and worries and they're less likely to be aware of what's going on around them. So it's good to talk to people about this if we're starting to see lots of little small things that we would normally think uh, we've got in the bag, slips, trips, falls, let's trap finger, all the, these sort of small things. When they start rising up lots, we tend to find that's when heads tend to drop lots. And if we can start catching that crossover, and talking about these things and opening up those conversations for our people, that can maybe help them see that the, the, the people do understand the frustrations and the, the anxieties and the uncertainty I'm going through. And sometimes that can be enough just to help lift them. But it's not just the front line that might be going through this sense of despondency. You, as a leader, could also be going through this as well. There'll be lots of changes to the way that you're operating and the, the ways that you're working. And you need to watch out for this in yourself as well. If you're starting to notice and feel despondency kicking in for you, it's about catching yourself. Because remember that that bridge between what you're doing, how you're acting and how you're talking to your people will have a major, major impact and their dis levels of despondency as well. So can, we can transfer this stuff between each other. So so watch out for that in yourself and watch out for that in your teams too. Now, we have covered quite a bit in terms of theory so far. Um, one of the things I want to do now is, is really start try to pull some of this together uh, and give you some practical things that you can maybe go and experiment with as a leader to see if we can start uh, looking at things differently out there in the field, with the way that we're engaging differently with our people. Because because engagement is a big word just now, but for me, it's, it's, it's it should be about more than that. It's not just about the engagement, it's about the engagement efficiency. Because obviously during these, these interesting times we're living in, a lot of companies have been doing lots of messaging, lots of engagement sessions, but nobody's really looking at how efficient they are, what's the payback, what's the buy-in for this, and, and, and what's the value in it. So that's the sort of stuff that uh, I want to share with you just now, especially if we're going to start trying to examine some of these relationship bridges, look for ways to make them stronger. For us, it's about maybe going in and getting a bit local with them. And these techniques I'm going to share with you, these tools, you can apply these to anything that you're doing at work. Um, this doesn't just need to be about health and safety stuff. You can use this for meetings. You can use it for site tours. You you name it, you can, you can do it. I've, I've done this for the amount of meetings before um, in terms of frequency of meetings for, for companies. Um, just to see if we can help them out a bit. So, so let's look at trying to find where the value is, um, how we can communicate differently, um, and looking for the percentage values that we've got from uh, the things that we're doing just now. Now, for me, communication is 
is an interesting topic. Lots of companies have been talking about words, tone and body language for a long time and stuff like that. Um, but I think there's other things that we could be looking at. Now, for me, you can frame messages in different ways, right? Where meaning you can take the same information, but completely change how it's perceived by the audience, depending how it's dressed up. Um, now, we like to work uh, at Cardale off of what we call a community model, where we like to go in, look at local areas, look at teams that work together regularly, and uh, try to build a sense of local community in that local area by tailoring the messaging that we're engaging with these people with to them, so their interests, they, what they find valuable, what, 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 what fascinates them, that's the way that we like to address the messages. But there's other ways that you can message things where historically a lot of companies have used what we call a corporate frame. So say a message comes out from the business, uh, it can fit into one of these two frames. Normally when a message comes out initially, it fits for us into a corporate frame, where we like to talk a lot about safety statistics and outputs, uh, we talk about quality, we talk about productivity, and we talk about things like cost. Okay, that's generally how a lot of corporate messages are framed. Now, when you, you, you share that out with uh, the, 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 the people on the front line, sometimes it's difficult for them to paint a picture in their mind of what specifically that means to them as an individual or as a small local group. So we sometimes take those corporate messages and dress them differently and place them into a community-based frame. And our community-based frame is we take that message and think to ourselves, how can we link this to things like self-worth and well-being? How can we link that directly to these people's families, their social interactions or their surroundings? That's the four sort of key things we like to, to share our messages with. So let me show you how we've done that with a client in the past. Um, we recently, they had a period of a year where they had 14 life changing in injuries um, and they wanted to, to brief out to their people um, that a year later, uh, they'd actually managed to reduce that by 11 and they'd only had three life changing injuries. So what they wanted to do was do it in a corporate frame initially, where they were stand, going to stand up with the group um, and talk to them about how unacceptable having three is. That's having a major impact on the safety stats. Um, you know, costs are going up, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it was very much a negative feel. And it was about people feeling disappointed that they hadn't met the objective of zero life changing injuries. So we'd, adv we'd advise them, right, let's do an experiment to see how's the best way to present this to your people. So we took one group, split them in two. One group went into one room, they got the corporate frame message, unacceptable, we're still having three, this isn't good enough, blah, 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 blah. Then this, another, the second group, they came into a room and they got the message, the same message, but they had it in a different frame. We placed it into a community-based frame. And the way that we presented that message to them was to say, look, uh, I'd like to stand up here today, uh, thank everybody in the room for all the efforts they've done in this previous year. Do you know, see this time last year we were stood here and we were talking about 14 life-changing injuries. See this year, we've saved 11 families over this previous year. We've only had three life-changing injuries. I'm not saying that that's, that's a good thing, that there's still three families out there, but that's 11 families we've saw, stopped going through pain and suffering that, that didn't do that last year. Now, the way the statistics work is I can't tell you whose families these are. It could have been your family, your family, your family, your, or it could have even been my family. We'll never know that. But all I can say is it was the efforts of everybody in here collectively. That's why I can stand here today and say we've saved those 11 families going through that suffering. So thank you. I want to thank everybody for all your efforts. We still have a bit of a hurdle to climb, though. We've still got these three. See if we were able to knock it out the park we are living over the past year. I'm sure we could maybe get this final three just polished off. So you up for it? Do you want to help us out with that? And we framed it like that. And what we found in the feedback comparing the two sessions is nobody fully engaged with the corporate frame. But when it was framed emotionally, it was about families, it was about saving, and it was about the thanking that's when people started switching on and they were able to make further changes as they went down the line because people were further engaged with that message than they were with the corporate one. So sometimes it's making small changes, getting imaginative and creative like that. That's the things that can help 
get rid of that any despondency that's starting to seep in, try to help us build new mental pairs and try to help us reinforce uh, the strength of the relationship bridges that we're in. Other things that you could experiment with, and, and this is stuff that, like I said, you can you can use for a, a, anything, but I'm going to talk about just a safety meeting here, just in terms of an example. Uh, another exercise that we like to play is go into local areas um, and, and sit down in a safety meeting, right? And what we'd like to do is in that meeting, we like to speak with the people that are there and we'd like to ask them some questions about good bad and where they feel value is. Um, so there's two exercises we like to run. Uh, first thing we ask, we, we, we run is what we call a percentage value exercise. So we ask them questions like, so So from the meetings, the way that they're framed just now, how much value do you feel you get from that as a percentage? Like, is it like 50% value? Is it 100%? Is it 80%? Is it 60, 50, 40, 30? And, and get them to try and score what value they feel they actually get from going to these meetings every day. Quite often you can identify a lot of waste that's going on. Some places I've visited, I've found out things like, um, I don't get much value out of that Wednesday meeting. And then when you ask them, why is it you don't feel that you get that value? They say, well, it's kind of like an inherited meeting for me. The guy that had the job before me, he used to always go to that meeting. So it was just assumed that I would. I don't even know why I go. So sometimes we can identify where a lot of wastage in terms of time is uh, if you start doing these sorts of exercises. Um, but to go back to the safety meeting for a minute. Once you've identified where the, the, the value is from that, you need to find out how you can up that. Now, the next exercise I like to do is I'll sit down with a group and I'll ask them questions like, so what would the best safety meeting in the world look like for you guys? What would be included in it? How long would it last? Who would present it? How would it be presented? Would it be humorous? Would it need to be serious? Is there statistics in it or is there no statistics? Or is there a wee bit of both? You know, I can get into all the nitty gritty details of what amazing would look and feel like for these people. And I'd make a big list of this for them. Uh, I normally do that on a flip chart or on a big bit of paper. I then get a new flip chart page and uh, ask them to do the opposite. What is the worst? meeting in the world look like for you folks and get the full detail of that, write all that up on the page. And, excuse me. And then I tend to pin these either on the wall or it's in two flip charts at each side of the room. And I'll stand in the middle uh, of those two bits of paper and I'll ask people in the room to imagine that this is like a scale from good to bad and ask them if I were to pace along that scale just to shout stop for where they roughly feel they're at for those meetings just now, in terms of the percentage value that they've been told us that they've got, and wait for them to identify where they feel they are. And once I've identified where the, they, they feel the meeting is, I then ask them, what would need to change for us to be able to take one pace towards that amazing picture? What would change and say in the next two weeks, what differences would you need to see to feel as if we're making progress? What would we start with? Is it the present? Is it the way that it's cut? And that gives you as the, 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 the leader, as the manager, the influencer, a start point to start reshaping your engagement efficiency with your people. Because this is all about relationships. Now, I mean, looking at KN, you've got a group of people that are doing some amazing work out there. They're out in the field. You know, some of them are specialists at what they do, right? This isn't about old school, like in the shipyard days, shouting and screaming at people, kicking them and telling them they've just got to get stuff done, right? This is now about trying to engage, build further and stronger relationship bridges so that we can all feel that we're in this together. Because everybody's got the right to get home safe at the end of every day. We've all got, we're all coming in here for the same reasons. Not many of us are punching the sky every day and saying, what can I do for KN this morning? Everybody's coming and going, what can I do for my family? What can I do for my lifestyle? This is the sort of things that are driving people into the workplace. And then as leaders, as managers, if we forget that, and we just make it all about the statistics and the numbers all the time, and the, and the, the, the performance indicators, and forget it, it's the relationships that we actually have that make all that real. We're always going to find ourselves struggling up against a, a swimming against a tide at times. So sometimes it's these subtleties that we've talked about today 
that can be the, the, the sort of turning point for a lot of people in leadership. And I can only hope that uh, you've enjoyed some of these uh, thoughts, some of these views, uh, and maybe even experiment with some of the tools that uh, we've shared with you. But other than that, folks, thanks very much for your time. Have a great day, uh, and I hope the safety week, the rest of it goes really well for you. Take care. All the best.